Hey, good evening, good evening. It's another evening for a Bible study. But hey, okay, this time I'm coming from my home <laughs> via Zoom for Bible study. And certainly COVID has really done a job on us and, you know, but thank God for this medium through which we can still share with each other. Last week, we started looking at the fact that Joel prophecy came and it was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. And we saw some things there that were fulfilled and subsequent to that, throughout the book of Acts, we see the, the power of the Holy Spirit through the apostles. Today, we want to make it even a little more personal because we want to start looking at the, the Christian, the individual, you and me, how the Holy Spirit can affect our lives. How can he accomplish great feet through us? And we, we just need to know what the Holy Spirit can do through us. Let us pray. Father, thank you, dear God, for this time. And Lord, edify your words even now. Through Jesus Christ, the Lord and our Savior. Amen. So here it is. I want to share my screen with you regarding our study today that we can share together and we can learn together. We can. So last week, just a quick, a quick recap. Last week, the promise received on the day of Pentecost and subsequent to that, we look at the fulfillment on, in Acts 2, 16 through 21, which was prophesied by Joel in Joel 2, 28 through 32. The apostles speaking in unlearned languages, we see that many nations heard them, the working of miracles, speaking boldly without, you know, fear of any persecution, speaking for God by inspiration with confidence and accuracy, conferring gifts of the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands, of their hands, receiving direction from the Holy Spirit, we are to go to preach and to spread the gospel. So today, do all Christians possess the Holy Spirit? Do all Christians possess the Holy Spirit? And that may sound simple, a question, but there are people who are calling themselves Christians who are not filled with the Holy Spirit because they have not subjected themselves to the conditions that God has laid down for them to fulfill, to receive the Holy Spirit. So let us start here. Let us start here. And ask another question. When is the Holy Spirit given to those who are obedient to the gospel? We can find the answer in Acts 2, 36 to 38, especially verse 38. So let us read. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. This is Peter on the day of Pentecost. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? We have heard the word. What shall we do? We need to do something. You have challenged us. And we are convicted. He said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What are the conditions to receive the Holy Spirit? What are the conditions to become a Christian, a follower of Christ? one whom Christ lived in, he said, repent, repent. 
do that right about turn. Express sorrow for the way you have been living a sinful life, sinning against God. And he said, if you are so convicted by the Holy Spirit and you need to do something, first you need to repent. You need to turn away from your sin. Make a right about turn. And turn to God. Then he said, when you are sorry, when you express that sorrow for all that you have done against God, he said, be baptized. Be immersed in watery baptism, which is critical, which is critical. Because you have so many people, and I've spoken to so many. Even last Sunday, I spoke to a man, and he said, yes, I'm a Christian, but I haven't been baptized yet. I've not been baptized as yet. Now, based upon what Peter says here, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins through baptism, through obedience to Christ. In watery baptism, you have your sins washed away or removed or forgiven or remitted by Almighty God. And then, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, God's Holy Spirit as a gift from God. So there are conditions that are laid down to become a Christian. So we can conclude the answer when we have repented of our sins, have been baptized and have our sins washed away. That's when we receive the Holy Spirit. That's when the Holy Spirit comes into our life. That's when we become Christians. I dwell on this a little because so many people today are just saying the so-called sinner's prayer. And that makes them a Christian. If that makes them a Christian, then what happened on the day of Pentecost is null and void. It doesn't have any effect. And Peter could have said to those, those people back then, repeat this prayer, a prayer like this. Father God, forgive me of my sins. I know I have sinned against you. Forgive me of my sins right now. Come into my heart and purify me. Amen. And for some preachers out there, that makes the person a Christian. <clears throat> that makes the person a Christian. No. Peter said, no. What makes you a Christian? What makes you a child of God? What makes you a son, a daughter of God is through repentance, through baptism, through having the forgiveness of your sins, that's what makes you a Christian. And that's critical. And we must point that out to them that they can know. They can know. Too many people are running around the place and not living for God as they should and calling themselves Christians. Too many. Too many. It's time we stop and think so that they can know. They can know. They can know. But let us continue. Where does the Holy Spirit live? Where does the Holy Spirit live? Does the Holy Spirit live in a building made by black and steel? Does the Holy Spirit live in the temple in Jerusalem? <laughs> no. The scripture tells us where the Holy Spirit lives. And so let us examine the scripture. The Holy Spirit lives in the body of every Christian. Our body is that housing where the Holy Spirit lives. The scripture calls it a temple. A temple. 
Back in olden days in the Old Testament, the temple represents the presence of God among his people. The temple was seen as holy, sacred, a place to be revered. And just think of our body the same way. A temple, a temple, a place that is holy, need to be revered, need to stand out, that when people look at our lives, they realize there goes the presence of Almighty God. Let us examine these scriptures right now. Romans 8, verse 11. And if the Holy Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. God raised Christ through his Holy Spirit. And he says that the whole, that same Holy Spirit is living in our body, in us. And the same way he raised Christ from the dead is the same way that he has given unto us life in this mortal body. Right now, you and I, every day we live, every day we walk, we are possessors of eternal life through the Holy Spirit. We are possessors of, holy, of life through the Holy Spirit. And the scripture says that he lives in our mortal body. Flesh, this body, he lives in it. Hallelujah, thank God. Thank God that he lives in our bodies. But it doesn't stop there, there are other scriptures. First Corinthians 6, 18 through 20. Paul urging, the Corinthians, as he's beseeching and urging all of us who are Christians to flee from sexual immorality, all forms of sexual immorality, be it homosexuality, lesbianism, be it bestiality, be it fornication, or you're unmarried or shacking up, he said, no. No, run away from all of that because what? All other sins a man commits are outside his body. But he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Wow. So the sex act is not just a physical act as so many are seen. It's also spiritual. It's also spiritual. And you realize that God is speaking and God is saying, don't do it, don't do it. Why? Verse 19, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own, you are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Your body is a temple of God. It's sacred. It's pure. It is where God is represented. It is where the presence of God is. And every day we walk, every day we talk, we must represent God. We must represent God. We must, brothers and sisters. And he's saying, we are the temples of God. You don't have to go to Jerusalem anymore. You don't have to go to a building anymore. He says, we are the living temple of Almighty God. Our lives must display holiness reverence to God, honor to Almighty God. Says we were bought with a price. 
the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Our soul, our spirit are precious. And our body must display all of this. So whatever takes place in the spirit takes place in the soul and the body follows. So let us be spiritual. Let us connect with the Holy Spirit. Let us connect with the Holy Spirit because our body is the temple of God. Hallelujah. Bless God. Jesus Christ says, our scripture continues and tells us in 1 John 3, 24, those who obey his commands live in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. Those of us who obey his commands, we live in Christ. And he lives in us. And how do we know it? By the spirit, the Holy Spirit that he has given unto us. Isn't it wonderful that we abide in Christ? We live in Christ. Oh, praise God. But first of all, Christ came to live in us. And the beauty about it, when we live in Christ, Christ live in God, we are fully covered. We are fully covered. We are fully covered. We are fully covered. And we praise God for this. We praise God for this. Praise God that we are temples of God. Christians, we must not take this lightly. It's important. It's important. So let us be wise, as Ephesians says. Let us realize that the days that we are living in are evil days. And let us walk circumspectly. Let us walk as wise men and women, children of God, and do not be squeezed into the mold of this world. Our young people are being pressured today to use their bodies as instruments of evil. They are being pressured to have sex, pressures to, to, to take drugs, to smoke, to drink alcohol. Your body is the temple of God. And God says, if you destroy your body, he's gonna destroy you. And what will be destroyed is not just your body, but your soul and your spirit will go into a, he a hell that is prepared for the devil and his angels and his demonic force. And you and me will join them if we don't allow God to work through this body of ours, which is a temple of Almighty God. Let us be wise. We are the temple of God. We walk, we talk, we live. And when we honor God with our bodies, then people out there will realize, hey, there's something different with this person. This boy, this man, this woman, something different because they will see the light of God shining through you, shining through me. We are temples of Almighty God. We are, we are, we are. We continue. We continue as temple of God. But the Holy Spirit, how does he help us? How can the Holy Spirit help me a Christian as he lives in me? How can he? There's a lot of help that is available to us. And we want to look at just a few for this study today as we continue to see ourselves as Christians, temples of Almighty God. First, the Holy Spirit helps me, okay? Helps me, the Christians, to overcome sin. Yeah, to overcome sin. Remember, this body that we are in is not slave to sin anymore, but slave to righteousness and holiness and truth. The scripture tells us in Romans 8, 
10 through 13. Let us re have some reading there. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin. Yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. Your body is dead because of sin. For many of us, we have viewed burials. We have been to the cemetery. How do they bury a dead person? Do they put them, put them on top, right on the grass there, on the pavement, and say ashes to ashes, dust to dust, and walk away, and leave that dead body right there? No, they don't. What they do, the hole is dug, and they place that casket into that hole, put concrete slab on it, or dirt, and covered it that the stench we would not smell because it is fully sealed, it is fully covered. And the scripture says that our body is dead to sin. At that baptism that we receive, that water covered our entire body, which symbolizes or symbolize the death of the fleshly man, the flesh, the death of all sinful habits. And the Bible says our body is dead to sin. You don't find a dead man getting up and going to party anymore. Or a dead man getting up and eating and drinking. You don't. When the body is dead, the body is dead and it is buried. We must always view, always have that picture in mind of that dead body and see ourselves as dead to this world and the sinful nature of this world. Dead to it, yet alive unto God, alive unto righteousness. We must always see ourselves alive unto righteousness. So the deeds that we do don't reflect the old stench, the old habit of sin, but now the new life, the new creation, the new creation. But it continues, verse 11. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, you who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. We just spoke of that, about that recently that eternal life dwells in us through God's Holy Spirit. Verse 12, therefore, brothers, we have an obligation. Yes, it is imperative, it's a must, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. No, it is not. The obligation is not to live according to this world and the sinful nature of this world and what the body craved after before you became Christian? No. <laughs> Check the obligation. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Praise God. Praise God. If we live according to the sinful nature, we will die. We will die physically, we will die spiritually. But if by the spirit, if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. The Holy Spirit feeds our spirit. The Holy Spirit feeds our soul. And when we become spiritually enlightened, when we are, have made contact with Almighty God and tune with Almighty God, then the things of this world pales into oblivion. The things of this world, my brothers and sisters, though they, they beckon to you and me, you and I are able 
to flee from them. We are able to disconnect from them. Yes, we are able to throw out them through the life that is in us. And the Holy Spirit feeds the Spirit, feeds your Spirit, feeds your Spirit. But we must also feed the Spirit. Because you can't be a Christian and feed on the filth of this world. Be through the television. Huh? Be through the music. Huh? Be through friends and what they do. And we leave what is spiritual and we feed upon that which is carnal and fleshly. We can't. We can't. Therefore, our obligation, that's what the, the scripture says, our imperative is to feed the spirit that we can live above sin and be victorious always against sin and against the holder of sin, the devil. We must, we must, we must. Let us look at another, how the Holy Spirit helps us. The Holy Spirit helps the Christian in prayer or through prayer. This is just wonderful. This is just wonderful and I praise God for this. That you and I may not know how to pray always. But the Holy Spirit prays for us. He helps us. Because oftentimes we don't. So we thank God. Romans chapter 8, 26 and 27. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. How wonderful. The Holy, the Holy Spirit intercedes. He talks to God with groans that words cannot express. You and I can't hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. But look what the scripture says in verse 27. And he who searches out, searches our hearts, knows the mind of the spirit. <laughs> That's God. Because the spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. Praise God. Praise God. The spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. You know, brothers and sisters, that's one prayer that always gets answered. <laughs> always. God always answers this prayer of the Holy Spirit. The scripture even tells us of Jesus interceding for us. And we're thankful. We're thankful. We're thankful. Because we do not know what to pray for. Most of the time, most of the time we want to pray for Lord healing. Lord, give me this. Bless me with this. Bless me with that. When in God's eyes, what we really need is wisdom. What we really need is discernment in this world. What we really need is more love, more patience, how we can be more faithful to Almighty God. The spiritual qualities that the spiritual man need to be fed with. Many times we don't pray for these things. We don't go to God earnestly and pray for these things. We don't. We must spend time even in fasting. Prayer and fasting. Set aside time when we do this. That we can draw from God. 
We can learn from God. We can be empowered by God's Holy Spirit. And thank God, the Spirit, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. And maybe that's one of our weaknesses. We don't know how to pray and what to pray for, really pray for. Because if we look forward to a heaven, an eternal home, to live with God throughout eternity, don't you think that you and I should spend more time being enriched by the spirit and the things that are spiritual that you and I can when we reach heaven, when we reach with God, we won't be disappointed. We won't be. Thank God for his Holy Spirit. Thank God that he spent time to pray for us in accordance with God's will. In accordance with God's will. And we must know God's will. Thank God that the Holy Spirit is praying for us and that God listens to him always and God answers his prayer always. And many times when you and I are praying for a flesh, the things, the things that are mundane, the things that are earthly, the Holy Spirit said, Lord, God, don't give him, but give her more patience. Give her more testing. Give him more trial. Give him that he can mold us, he can make us into the instrument that he wants us to be. God wants to mold us. God wants to make us. God wants to. God wants to. I thank God. Thank God. Thank God. <laughs> that the Holy Spirit helps us in our prayers. Number three. This will be the last one for this study. The Holy Spirit seals the Christian. He's a seal upon us. And we'll look at the scripture today. But next week, certainly we'll look at identifying the seal. But let us know. The Holy Spirit seals the Christian. And Ephesians chapters 1, 13 to 14, and chapter 4, verse 30. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. God places seal upon us as a deposit. A deposit. <laughs> you know, when you put a deposit on something, you have hope and you expect someday that you'll be able to pay it off, that you can get that thing. God has placed a deposit upon us and that's his Holy Spirit upon us until that day when our complete redemption will take place. Redemption from this world, redemption from this body, and we receive our celestial body. He has seen the Son to the day of redemption. You know, the, the Greek, the original meaning there speaks of that engagement ring that that man will give to that sweet young lady, that beautiful young lady that he wants to marry. And he said, here's an engagement ring. And at some point in time, the wedding is going to take place. The marriage will take place. And someday, yes, the marriage will take place. The bride, the church of the living God will put on that robe of righteousness, of pure white, pure white, praise God. 
Ephesians 4 says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. We must not grieve him. We must not sin against him. Every sin we commit cause the Holy Spirit to be grieved. Every sin. And we must not grieve the Holy Spirit. As a child would grieve his parent, when the parent says, don't do that, and the child goes out and do the opposite of his parents, what his parents said he should not do, they go and do it. Then punishment comes, and that parent is grieved to the heart. You and I must not grieve the Holy Spirit because he has sealed us unto the day of redemption. Something else is coming. The day of redemption is coming. When we won't have a problem with sin anymore, with the devil anymore, with trials anymore, a day, a new day will come that God has in store for you and me. We praise God. We praise God. Next week, we will look at identifying the seal. Identifying the seal. That Holy Spirit, what it means. What does it mean when the Bible says the Holy Spirit is a seal upon us? For we praise God. We praise God. So next week, we will look at that. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this study today. And we thank you, dear God, for your presence. Help us, Lord, to remember you, dear God, that, Lord, you are living in us. And you urge us and you convict us that, Lord, we will live above sin and live to righteousness always. Lord, thank you for your seal. Thank you for your blessings. Through Jesus Christ, so Lord, and our Savior. Amen. Amen. So God bless you, brothers. God bless you, sisters. It's a great time as to praise God. And if the curfew is still on next week, then we will have to have another Zoom. But we praise God. Praise God. God bless you.